Becoming the Crocodile If you stand only on the safety of the banks, spearing fish, how can you know the depths of the river? Can you fathom the darkness under a ledge of rock, or understand the life of the fish writhing on your spear? You mistake the teeth of the crocodile as the edge of the abyss, but the chasm is more terrible than teeth and certain. I fulfill the law, and the law demands your blood. I am Sebek, the crocodile, the catastrophe, the devourer, the necessity. Impaled on my teeth, you shall be blessed, for you will glimpse truth. I am only the secrets of your own dark heart, your lust, your greed, your anger, your flesh, to tear the darkness from your heart. I am the living power of water, the cry that catches in the throat, the sob that shatters stone. On my teeth you smell the stink of flesh, to you I seem a living horror. But I tell you in truth, I am your own soul, and it is with great sorrow that I crush the life you have made. I weep with the loss, but you do not believe. Such destruction is madness, you say. You do not understand. Is it madness to cut the wheat so that bread can be made? When you were born in this bright land, did you not weep for the lost dark of the womb? Whether or not you understand the law, you exist because of it. When you've reached the lips of the great devourer, you are staring into the jaws of creation. That was from the Egyptian Book of the Dead. Translation by Normandy Ellis. Appropriate for this show theme, and appropriate for a continued fight against wickedness in high places. Yes, we're going to ancient Egypt, the land of the dead according to some Gnostics, and the beginning of human consciousness according to other Gnostics. All to uncover more liberating but heartbreaking truth. Wise man once told me, don't ask questions you don't want to know the answer to. Once upon a time, the priest and the king conspired to completely control the collective consciousness of the tribe. They marginalized the wise woman and murdered the shaman. They built towering monuments to angry solar demons and sacrificed children and animals to extraterrestrial invaders. They hoarded the resources, weaving honeyed lies that made the artist and poet fall asleep. So bad it was that the Joker and the Thief wondered if there must be some way out of here. And here we are, tens of thousands of years later. The few of us waking up slowly, even as Moloch laughs as he rules over corporate boardrooms, Western governments, and a digital madness that has overcome the entire globe. You see, none of it was real. It was illusion. Your art, your science, it was all a nightmare. Now it's done. Finished. Here we are, Montresor. The few of us. Waking up slowly with our broken chakras and broken dreams before the wrath of the crocodile god Sebek. Seeing the two-man grift of the priest and the king, Odin and Loki sometimes. Here we F and R, we Nostigoi, under the hologram of the empire that never ended with the god in the gutter and the despised philosopher's stone buried in the mud. But as Oscar Wilde said, we are all in the gutter, but some of us are looking at stars. Even the smallest person can change the course of the future. Do I sound crazy? Absurd? A priest and a king still doing their two-man grift? Ah, yes. Ah, yes. It was C.G. Jung who once said, The highest truth is one and the same with the absurd. And it was April DeConnick who wrote, 
The ultimate concern of the Gnostic is to awaken the divine potential in each of us, to bring our permanent, deep self to consciousness. By the power of truth, I, while living, have conquered the universe. So fuck you, Sebek. Fuck you, priest, and fuck you, king. Fuck your laws and fuck your children's sacrifices. Fuck you too, joker and thief. Because we're not getting out. We're fighting from the gutter. We're restoring the shaman and the wise woman. The artist and the poet. Fuck your two-man grift. We are waking up and we are gaining gnosis with each lunar cycle. We're never gonna stop. Fuck you. We're gonna do so many wonders. We're going to write our own gospel and live our own myth. I reveal myself to myself and I am drenched and purged. Woo. Beyond quoting others, I haven't cursed in years as part of a Lent promise. But I had to. Please forgive me. As you might know, we've recently celebrated our 13th year, and heresy shouldn't be this much fun. But it's also enraging, as we realize together we've been lied to so much, that all history is fiction. As James Joyce said, History is a nightmare from which I am trying to awaken. And the truth. The waking up is found in those bardos or liminal places beyond that history written by the victors and those holy texts written by the vicars, as Vance likes to say. So welcome to the gutter. Welcome to Aeon Bite Gnostic Radio, to seeing stars and creating better than the creator gods and their catamites in the establishment. My father says that almost the whole world is asleep. Everybody you know, everybody you see, everybody you talk to. He says that only a few people are awake and they live in a state of constant, total amazement. I was once a Braxis, but no longer. I'm separating from this entity for reasons to come, or maybe that have passed. I'm just Miguel Connor, your humble madman across the waters, broadcasting this blasphemy. Thirteen years, so that means thirteen aeons of Yaldabaoth, and time to move on. The priest and the thief, the victor and the vicar, gave us this holographic history that hides the empire. Like the Gospel of Thomas says, the Pharisees and the scribes have taken the keys of Gnosis and have hidden them. They did not go in, and those who wished to go in, they did not allow. But you, be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Train yourself to let go of everything you fear to lose. In this red pill cafeteria, we continue bringing the hologram down. Of course, much of the Bible is a bittersweet lie. And our astral guest is unparalleled in revealing biblical truths from the Old Testament, as he has in past interviews and in his game-changing books. That is the adroit Gary Greenberg, who materializes at the Virtual Alexandria to discuss his latest book, Genesis Chronology and Egyptian King List, The Egyptian Origins of Genesis History. For more information on the amazing Gary, please visit BibleMyth.cam. The idea that religion and politics don't mix was invented by the devil to keep Christians from running their own country. As a bonus for members and patrons, beyond the full interview, I'll be including an old interview with Gary, based on his book, 101 Myths of the Bible, where we really get granular on many OT events like Adam and Eve, Sodom and Gomorrah, Jacob and Esau, 
and more. Moses, this is the Lord thy God commanding you to obey my law. Do you hear me? Yes, I hear you, I hear you. A deaf man could hear you. What? Nothing, I punished you, forget it. Some have told me my message is rather negative. They suggest I lean towards hermeticism. <laughs> Even though hermeticism talks a lot about being trapped in the body and the black iron prison. I actually think my message is very positive. Perhaps the most positive of all. Until every person admits they are addicted to the world. They can't even help the world. Being useful takes a considerable amount of freedom. The only way to see the stars from the gutter is to breathe poetic fire on the deception of the demiurge. Come on then. Back to creation. I mustn't waste any more time. They'll think I've lost control again and put it all down to evolution. And remember, as Jeremy Puma said... Gnosis isn't the result, but what brings the result? The result, all the results, are freedom and ecstasy. Yes, that mystery religion and shamanistic ecstasy the ancient Gnostics were part of. And it's all over their texts and the records of the church fathers, even as their myths are darksome indeed. You gotta tell them! Silent Green is people! Wikipedia says that religious ecstasy is, quote, a type of altered state of consciousness characterized by greatly reduced external awareness and expanded interior mental and spiritual awareness, frequently accompanied by visions and emotions and sometimes physical euphoria. Toughened your nipples, didn't it? Ecstasy should be both your ritual and goal. Doesn't mean you have to drink a DMT milkshake or dance with Sufis and Lionel Richie all night long. Ecstasy can come to you when you're intensely working on a piece of art, jamming to music while riding your bike, making love below a May thunderstorm. It's a joy so profound you could devour the sun and shatter the moon with your laughter. It's what gets you out of your mind and into the mind of the alien god who smashes all boundaries and exemplifies pure arrows mixed with agape. It's who you were meant to be, and it terrifies the priest and the king. What other questions are there? What other questions are there, really? You, you want to understand the universe. Embrace the universe. The, the door to the universe is you. Thanks for being here in this 13th year, in this 13th aeon. In Saturn retrograde, I am vanishing, but you are rising so strong and beautiful. You are the final authority, have always been led us to the interview with Gary Greenberg on his new book, Genesis Chronology, an Egyptian Kingless. But first a quote from The Ending of the Invisibles by Grant Morrison. It goes, We make gods and jailers because we felt small and ashamed and alone. We let them try us and judge us and, like sheep to slaughter, we allowed ourselves to be sentenced. See? Now, our sentence is up. And as Sri Dadaji said, the cage is open if you want to get out. This is the Aeon Byte interview, and with us, we definitely have the pleasure of being joined back by Gary Greenberg to discuss his new book, 
Genesis Chronology and Egyptian King List, the Egyptian origins of Genesis history, as well as some of his other very impactful and I feel very important work. How are you doing, Gary? And it's uh, really great to have you back. Good to be here again. Thank you very much. And with us, too, we've got the Moondog, Vance Sachi. How are you doing, Vance? Oh, I'm fine. Looking forward to this because one of my favorite theories about Akhenaten. Yes, well, there's a lot, and Gary has spent quite a bit of time. So, uh, again, Gary, it's been a while since you've uh, graced the show, the podcast. So perhaps mm -hmm. you could uh, give the audience a little, a little bit about who you are. And I think it's fascinating because you have an impressive body of work, and you're always putting this uh, great material out. But uh, your background is uh, much different than most would expect, right? Yeah, well, I'm... A retired attorney now, but I used to do criminal defense work. But since I was young, I had a, an interest in how myth and history intersect with each other. And that sort of led me down this road in one way or another and branched off in different directions. Uh, but that's the starting point. And I've always tried to stay within mainstream scholarship. Uh, I think one of the problems for a lot of stuff is uh, they come up with esoteric theories that require bizarre interpretations of the existing evidence rather than rely on what the establishment sort of s recognizes to be the case. But that's different from interpreting the evidence. And I think uh, from my legal background, I think that kind of gives me a kind of an advantage because in legal training, you learn how to sort of analyze data and figure out how to turn things around, you know, what's behind data, you know. Uh, not many people realize that part of legal training. Uh, you look at something that looks like it's against you when you're preparing a case and you have to explain why it isn't against you. And when something is in favor of you, you have to understand how someone can un interpret that to be against you. So it's it's a tricky and difficult situation, but logic is what's behind a lot of it. Yeah, that makes sense. And it also, does it help the fact that, again, you're not, uh, you are a scholar, but of course, a scholar of law. You're not beholden to a university or anything like that. So you don't have right. to, uh, you don't have to toe the line because we all know there is a line to be towed, whether it's uh, Judaism, Christianity, or Islam. In many situations, that's definitely the case. And Usually, few people go into these fields, particularly where it touches on Bible, that don't at least have a preset set of views about the Bible uh, and what it means as part of their background. Although you have to acknowledge that there's a tremendous amount of great scholarship that goes on in the biblical field by scholars who aren't handicapped by having to look at it through theological blinders. Nevertheless, it's still there is our like the academy consensus leading you in directions. So they're not too happy with people who stray off the reservation. Yeah, I bet. I think uh, there's something you write in your blog. I was looking at your site today and you write uh, that you, quote, explore problem areas in biblical studies, both Jewish and Christian, that either remain unresolved in academic circles or that I believe need to be reconsidered from a new perspective. So that has been your work, basically looking at, uh, you might say, the blind spots that have been around. That's true. That's pretty much what it is. And when you start getting behind this stuff, uh, particularly when my, with my recognition of the various connections between ancient Egypt and the early stages of the Bible, you begin to see connections that neither field is able to make because neither field knows what the other is doing very much. Yeah, and I bet because it's probably even more complicated because you are just not studying the Abrahamic religions, but you're also studying Egyptology. Well, how did it start? Or did you start with it, Egyptology? Or did it start with uh, Judaism and Christianity, and then you work your way back? Well, it actually started technically outside of all of these fields, uh, looking into 
uh, what was an early interest of mine was Indo-European mythology. And that led me into something like the Atlantis myths, which I wanted to get a handle on. And in pursuing that, I came, I had to start looking into the Noah story and flood stories and such. And that's when I began to see the, you know, the Noah story embedded in a lot of chronology, and, or at least in biblical chronology. And that started to intrigue me. And actually, the stuff I do in this book, uh, in Genesis chronology and Egyptian king lists, is actually where I started off in this area. Um, and that's what led me to the material that eventually became the Moses mystery. Um, and the Akhenaten connection, I wound up developing the chronological framework. And how has that been received? I mean, I'm sure you must be stepping on some toes because they are, again, Christian, Jews, and Muslim who take this very literal. I was even reading some of the, the Christian apologetic site tectonics, and uh, he was not very happy with your material, so I'm sure there's yeah. been some pushback. <laughs> there is. Uh, sometimes it's funny. I sometimes get criticized for being right. Uh, <laughs> uh you know, they'll say something. Well, that might be the case, but what you don't really understand is, and then they drive off into some other direction, completely unrelated. Um, but you know, the, the the basic difference between history and theology, and that's really an important thing to understand, is that in theology, you start with a fixed position. Then you have to look for evidence to make everything fit the fixed position. In history, you start out with a lot of data, and your position is what theory best explains this data, wherever it leads. Now, obviously, many scholars will have some biases, uh, intentionally or otherwise, that leads them in certain directions, but still the principle is the same. Uh, and a lot of, you know, in biblical scholarship, you have a lot of good stuff because they're looking at problems. They know that these problems are inconsistent with theology, and yet they're prepared to pursue them and see where they go. But if you teach in something like a seminary, there'll be substantial restrictions on what you're allowed to teach and preach and so on and write. I bet. And I think there's a story I wanted to share with you. I don't know if you heard this story, but to me, it always makes sense. Again, you're talking about that difference between history and theology, how they don't have to be antagonistic. But the story is uh, there was a rabbi who was giving his son was going to bed and the rabbi was reading his son the story of Noah, the flood story. And the son looks from his bed and says, Papa, is this story, did this really happen? And the rabbi says, well, I don't know if it happened, but I know it's true. What do you think of that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of that. Uh, a lot of scholars, it's really very interesting, sort of almost have a double life in biblical studies. Uh, they are firm believers in their religious principles, but they put them aside for their historical analysis, and they can distinguish on the grounds that history isn't necessarily certain. This is just one viewpoint, which may or may not be correct, but it's what you find when you use the historical method. That doesn't mean it's always correct. Many people come up with a lot of ideas in history that are often wrong. Uh, so it's one thing to recognize what some evidence may show, what some evidence actually shows, and what sometimes is often very speculative. One of the problems I find interesting, I mentioned it, I think, partially, briefly in the Moses mystery, is people come to the Bible with all these ideas about how true so much of this stuff must be. And then when you point out that other cultures have similar stories that take place earlier, they say, oh, well, that can't be because the Bible tells the truth. But if the Bible is telling the truth, why wouldn't they know those stories also? <laughs> yeah, or you can be like... Yet we uh, call them myths, <laughs> and when they're in the Bible, we don't call them myths. But it's the same story in many cases. 
Well, you could be like uh, the church father Tertullian or Justin Martyr saying that Satan planted these before so he could fool the faithful. I'm sure that goes like a lead balloon with historians, right? <laughs> yeah, although, uh, you know, one of the very interesting theories that some of the early church fathers had, a uh, very good theory, I think, is if you are reading the Bible and you find something in there that doesn't make sense from what you see around you and what you know, then maybe you're interpreting it incorrectly. And of course, they always bring in allegories and all sorts of other stuff whenever they need to solve a problem. Yeah, that always drove me crazy with uh, sometimes arguing with people who are literal is you go literal, they go allegorical, you go allegorical, they switch it to literal. It's a, yeah. it's a no-win situation. <laughs> right. Because the bottom line is always from the theological side, what version proves the facts that we want to hear? Exactly. A little confirmation bias in the morning with our coffee, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. I've been there in the past. I wish I was better, but uh, hopefully I'm better. Now I just enjoy my coffee. But <laughs> we want to get to definitely work on Genesis chronology in the Egyptian king list. But I think we should maybe sort of uh, summarize your work and some of your ideas from your books, uh, 101 Myths of the Bible and the Moses Mystery, because it gives context to your new work. Which is, uh, yeah, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty scholarly. It's pretty detailed. You even say uh, you're going to have to do some math if you read this book. So people, well, arithmetic, I think. Yeah, arithmetic. <laughs> <laughs> so, I didn't want to bring it up too high a level, but <laughs> a lot of people freeze when you have to do more than figure out the tip on your dinner bill. I'm probably one of those. I mean, uh, I am one of those people when I read the, uh, I think that's 99% of the world, right, Gary? You get yeah. to that genealogy in the Bible and you're like, oh my God, I'm going to fall asleep. Let me just yeah. thumb past it because it's mm -hmm. uh, the years and all these generations. But uh, yeah. But uh, so why don't we talk about one of your central ideas and that is how the Israelites came about. And you basically argue that they weren't just some nomadic tribe that had been around that were influenced by the cultures around them originally. They were actually, once upon a time, true Egyptians. Uh, well, there was a central core group that was in Egypt. And uh, it seems to me, you know, my work uh, pretty much demonstrates that a lot of the earlier stuff from the first two, you know, Genesis and Exodus, are clearly heavily influenced by uh, Egyptian history, mythology, and chronology, and so forth. Um, and what I eventually tried to demonstrate through chronology and history and other factors, evidence and archaeology and literature, is that there's a connection between the initial foundation of what became Judaism and the religious views of Pharaoh Akhenaten, who was a monotheistic sort of pharaoh in Egypt and created a tremendous cultural clash in his country. Um, oddly, uh, my date for the Exodus and the traditional Jewish date for the Exodus are only a couple of years apart, but we arrived at them by very, very different methods. Yet, for whatever it is, despite their date, which would still be consistent with my ideas, they never want to explore that connection because they want Judaism to be unique. Anyhow, the basic theory was, uh, in history, from the history of Egypt, we know that after Akhenaten died and had this big religious revolution where he declared there was only one God and went around chiseling the chief deities out of the monuments and so on, wherever their names appeared and so on. There was a counter-revolution after he died, shortly after he died. And the followers of Akhenaten were actually persecuted by the Egyptian, by the re return of the G Egyptian throne. Uh, to the extent there's any credibility to the idea that Moses was an adopted member of the royal family, it would have been in Akhenaten's family that he would have been adopted, not by Akhenaten, but probably by Akhenaten's father. So when 
after Akhenaten died, and then there was one or two, his uh, Tutankhamun came on the throne, and then the line ended, and then we started getting generals uh, taking over the uh, monarchy. And one of these was Horemheb, who had done a lot of persecution of the Aten uh, followers. And when he died, it was my contention that Moses, who had fled Egypt, came back based on his claim to be a member of the royal family through adoption, that he was the legitimate ruler of Egypt, not Ramses I, who I make as the uh, pharaoh of the Exodus. And uh, who re- and the, so there was a struggle between the Atnis forces backed up by other forces from uh, Canaan and Nubia and elsewhere. And uh, Ramses I, who came to the throne, sought the throne as one of the generals. Uh, they came to a standstill. Uh, the Moses group didn't have the sufficient resources to win the conflict, and they negotiated a... Uh, safe passage out of Egypt uh, with Ramses, and that's what became the Exodus. Uh, But they weren't actually Israel at that point. They were an Egyptian group in which the name Israel came to be associated. And not too far after that, about a century later almost, we find Israel mentioned for the first time in an Egyptian inscription known as the Merneptah Stella, uh, in which it talks about uh, Pharaoh Merneptah defeating several nations, one of which was Israel. But Israel in that stella is described as a people without a land. Everybody else is a territorial ruler. Israel is just a group of people without a specific uh, territory boundary. Uh, which was very unusual and strange. And we don't hear the name Israel again for almost 400 years in the archaeological record. So that's the background uh, from where I was coming. So Moses would have been educated as an Egyptian, as the Bible tells us. Uh, He was a member of the royal family. He would have had a royal education. He would have been thoroughly intimate with what would have been Egyptian history, Egyptian mythology, Egyptian traditions, And he brought those out with him. Uh, Several members of his tribe had Egyptian names in the Bible. And uh, so that was the main theory. And then when Israel, the group that became the core group, which was basically the Joseph group and the Moses group, uh, they merged with other Canaanite peoples and some of the Greek sea peoples uh, who were the actual invaders of the Canaan. At the same time, Israel was moving into uninhabited territory. The Philistines and other sea peoples from Greece were moving into the same lands, but coming across from the west into the east, while the Israelites were settling in the eastern area. And what happened is they slowly... They didn't hide their Egyptian gods, or they started adopting some of the Canaanite gods, and they just fused together? Not quite. They merged in with their cultural surroundings. The Mycenaean Greeks that formed part of their coalition uh, from uh, Crete and Mycenae uh, brought some of their religious traditions and mythologies. Canaanites had their religious traditions and so on. And what was going on from the theological perspective is they, the core group believed in a monotheistic form, or at least a chief deity, and they were rewriting Egyptian mythology or Egyptian theology, if you would, uh, by transforming many of the gods and deities from deities into humans. So a lot of the people who appear in the Bible as humans, including Abraham, Jacob, and many of their ancestors, were actually deities. You know, people like Adam, 
uh, where really Adam was just a variation on the god Adam, which was one of the chief Egyptian deities of creation. Uh, and you find a lot of that stuff. But they decided to adopt the tribal god Yahweh, who was probably, what, the son of El or something like that? Well, at some point they came in, you know, there was, El was basically the Canaanite chief deity, along with Baal. And a lot of the early Israelites had Baal names. Uh, the first king of Israel, Saul, had sons with the name Baal. Uh, the, some of the, one of the more of the judges had Baal in their name. This was a later embarrassment to uh, Egyptian redactors, and you know, and hundreds of years later, and they tried to change the names by substituting other names. So you find certain characters in the Bible with two different names, uh, like Gideon and Jeroboam, which are the same person, and they get confused in the story. Uh, so they were adopting, and there were other deities, uh, singular deities. Um, Yahweh is particularly a difficult one to identify, although there does appear to be a deity from uh, sort of the Edomite area that might have had that name. Uh, I sometimes speculate that Yahweh might be a uh, variation or a transliteration of Zeus, who was Dios or Diave, um, but I can't make that argument for certain. Wouldn't be surprised. He was a storm god and a stormy god for sure. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, Vance, uh, do you have a question for Gary? Because I know that's one of your interests is the, the, the story of Akhenaten and the Egyptian influence on the world. Yeah, definitely. I got a couple. Uh, Gary, do you happen to know if what the Egyptian language codification was for Israel when it occurred, like which hieroglyphics or does that give us any insight into the tie-ins between, you know, the nation of Israel and the Egyptians? No, unless you could uh, find some connection. I, I, again, I have a theory that on the name Israel uh, in which the Egyptians frequently hyphenated gods together, joined gods together with like Adam Ra and so on, where there were similar kinds of characteristics. Yeah. And I suspect that at some point, Israel, the first part of Israel is yeast. Uh, and I'm not sure where, you know, there, you could have arguments about what it means, but the rest of it is Ra El. And so I'm one, I do speculate, although I can't prove yet, that Ra El is a hyphenated Egyptian canaanite god ra in egypt and el in canaan being pretty much the same kind of deity yeah that's pretty tempting also um are you familiar with the rosicrucians uh ideas on akhenaten and um do you think that their ideas hold any water i am not really familiar with the rosicrucians i just remember when i was younger i saw they had ads in magazines a lot oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> comic books all that <laughs> Still do. <laughs> oh, yeah, in the back, on the matchbooks and all that. <laughs> well, actually, one of their, um, I'm not sure they have as much uh, scholarly background as you've amassed, but um, they are big into the um, fact that Akhenaten was monotheistic and so forth. And uh, they have that Egyptian uh, museum in San Jose that I've been to many times. And so they're pretty big proponents. And I well, believe you know, they, you know, think the same thing about the connection between the uh, Israelites and the Egyptians. You know, there's an important player in Egyptian history from the third century BCE named Manetho. Manetho wrote a history of Egypt, but his history has been lost and it's only been preserved in later writings by Josephus and Christian writers who were very interested in his chronology, um, trying to see how it matched up with biblical chronology, and that's why they preserved his chronologies. But Manetho also preserved a story in which he pretty much straight out says that Moses was connected to the Akhenaten movement and led a revolution against the Egyptians. 
and scholars who know, you know, both Egyptologists and biblical scholars who are aware of the story do everything they can to try to discredit that saying, oh, well, it's just a myth. It's just a legend. It's just this. It's just that. And in fact, there's no reason to think that's the case. Uh, the story very clearly associates Moses with Akhenaten. It makes Moses a priest, uh, a, uh, and pretty much almost a ruler. You have to interpret the story a bit, but there's no doubt about it. Um, so Egypt itself preserves legends connecting Moses to Akhenaten. Yes, and in your new book, you definitely talk about Manitho. And you could say, well, for example, you mentioned Josephus and Eusebius, who both aren't exactly the most honest historians, but you also mention Africana. So when these church fathers are all saying that there's probably a little bit of fire with all this smoke. Well, what's going on is Manetho's history was loaded with chronological information going back into the mythological era. I mean, his History originally included the history of the chronology of the gods and so forth. He wasn't the only one who had that chronology, a chronology of the gods, but he has more of it remaining than anyone else did. And so from the first dynasty in the year 3000 or so, all the way down to the third, di uh, first dynasty, uh, to the, I'm sorry, 30th dynasty, just before Alexander the Great conquered Egypt, uh, he was loaded with information on chronology. And then, you know, the way they did books in those days, there would be a manuscript and someone would write a copy of the manuscript and someone else would copy it and someone else would copy it. And we don't know what that language he probably wrote in Greek, but maybe not in good Greek because it may not have been his native language. But Greeks reading Egyptian stuff did not understand the Egyptian stuff. And they kept screwing up everything, uh, lots of stuff that he wrote and mistranslated names and got names wrong, changed Egyptian God names to Greek God names and misread and misunderstood a lot of what was being said. And this led them to screw up the chronologies. And this is a well-known problem in Egyptian studies. They know that Manetho originally had very accurate history, or, not, or at least had access to an accurate history going back to the earliest era. And very often they'll use some of his stuff in reconstructing, reconstructing Egyptian chronology. But there are massive areas where this stuff, his history is screwed up and nobody figured out how to unravel that. And one of the things I do in my book is point out the problem is really very simple if you understand what's going on, is he was double counting, for the most part, summation lines. There would be something like six kings, and then there would be a line saying, to so-and-so, X number of years, and they would treat that as a new king or a new dynasty or a new period of time. And so they were making the lists longer and longer instead of recognizing things were summations. And that created a lot of trouble. And I, in the book, that's where you start needing to do a little arithmetic. You have to recognize something is twice as big as something else or things of that sort. And when you start doing that, it all starts falling into a lot of it falls into place. And you can see not only did Manetho have a correct chronology in his original source, it was almost fully consistent with what we know from other chronological information. But once you understand that his chronology in its original form was reasonably accurate, you can fill in a lot of gaps that are missing in the chronological record, which is something I do. And when you do that, you begin to see more and more connections with the uh, biblical chronology. And uh, when was he around? You say he wrote Greek. Was he part of the Ptolemy dynasty? Or yes, even before he was that? a Ptolemaic period priest, third century BCE. And he was a priest in the city of Heliopolis, oh. which was noted as one of the most learned areas in the world at the time.
Wonderful. And uh, going back to Akhenaten, can we say that he really was a monotheist or more what they call it a henotheist? I mean, did he believe everything was one or just there was one God who was more powerful than the others? It's a tricky question. He was for, at least for all practical purposes, monotheistic, but the God wasn't Aten. The god was really Ra Harakti, a combination of Ra and Horus of the Horizon. And Aten, the disc, was a symbol, a manifestation of the god. So you have a hybrid god behind him, uh, because the Egyptians tended to do a lot of that stuff where they saw similarities. They would blend concepts together. Um, So, but... So to a large extent, it was monotheistic, but his target was primarily rival creation god, uh, particularly Amun, uh, who was the uh, chief deity of the Theban dynasty that he belonged to, and uh, a couple of other deities who were very prominent. And those were his main targets. He didn't do very much to most of the other deities. Uh, he just sort of ignored them, but he went around sending workers to chisel out the name Amun wherever they would find it on monuments. So he was mostly attacking the Amun cult, which was the dominant priest culture at that time. So moving into your book, you talk about one of the problems that you have with with Egypt, and I think you, you just mentioned it with Manitho and so forth, and that's Egyptian chronology. What is the problem of understanding Egyptian chronology, Gary? Okay, well, that's the big issue. <laughs> <laughs> Egyptian chronology is a very hard subject, as are most ancient chronologies, because you're missing a lot of data. The first problem that, or or, let me put it in perspective, until the early 20th century, the main source of information that uh, civilizations had of Egyptian chronology were the copies of Manetho's history made by Eusebius and Africanus and Josephus. And they built their chronologies of Egypt around those. I suspect, although I can't prove, it's only a suspicion, the reason that the Septuagint version of Genesis has a longer chronology for creation and the following period, uh, in the period I cover, is that they were trying to harmonize it with what they thought was the Manetho chronology so that they could match his longer chronological period. Uh, Anyhow, so we start off, one, we have this very broken chronology from Manetho as our guideline. Two, the Egyptians didn't date anything on an absolute time frame. They had no anchor dates. Uh, it's not like our calendar where we say there was everything happened in a certain time frame and we go back right. and forth. They dated things by what year in a pharaoh's reign something happened. They would say in year 10 of the reign of Amenhotep I, this took place. But when did Amenhotep I rule? We don't know. Or we didn't know initially at first. Now, along the way, you find a lot of evidence. You find records of partial king lists, uh, records of how long kings ruled or partial rules, and you start building some pictures together. But theoretically, if you don't have a chronologically written king list of sorts, at least of some sort, with anchor dates, uh, it's hard to put the lists together. And there were two major gaps in the record that they couldn't reconcile, along with a lot of gaps in the record. And this is even before you get to anchor dates. There's two periods in Egyptian history, one called the first intermediate period and one called the second intermediate period. And 
we have almost no detailed data, chronological data for either of these. And these resulted in the initial stages with huge gaps in the chronological records. So we didn't know where to put a lot of things. Now, the next problem is we have several major Egyptian king lists, but several of, most of them have no chronological information. And a lot of them left out the material in the first and second intermediate period. So the records didn't even have the same, didn't match the Egyptian history. In addition, the records often didn't agree with each other. They had different numbers of kings, different sequences, and so forth. So what needed to be found was some way to anchor the evidence that was developing. We could put partial lists together based on family records. Uh, this king followed that king. This king, we find a, a final year date or a near final year date. And we find a lot of this evidence. But we needed an anchor date. And that was the key problem we had. And it came about in a very surprising, unexpected way. The most important event in Egypt every year was the flooding of the Nile. That was the key to Egyptians, Egypt's prosperity and abundant agriculture. But if you have an annual event, you need to know when it's coming up. And it's hard to keep track of without a calendar. And the Egyptian calendar at the time, the, what was called the civil calendar, had a 365-day year based on the solar year. But they didn't make allowances for the, the extra quarter day every year in the solar year. So every year, the Egyptian calendar was falling a little bit out of sequence with the solar calendar. And therefore, after a while, you couldn't use the civil calendar to predict when the new year would come. So they had a major problem. And they noticed that there was a star in the sky named, uh, they called it Sopdet, the Greeks called it Sothis. We now know it as Sirius. And they noticed that every year, Sirius disappeared for 70 days. And the first day it peered back almost perfectly coincided with the uh, onset of the Nile flood. And they decided to use that as their official new year. So they now had this Sothic system and they invented a calendar around the Sothic rising every year. And if you do a quickie arithmetic, the basic starting point, if you lose one day every four years, uh, if you multiply 365 days by four, you get 1,460 years. And that meant that if every 1,460 years, New Year on this big Sotha calendar and New Year on the civil calendar occurred on the same day. It's kind of an odd system, but you now have a 1,460-year period repeated more than one time. So you have a potential for an anchor date. The Egyptians periodically recorded events based on what year of the Sothic cycle that happened. And they, you were now able to create, if you knew, uh, if you could find information when a Sothic cycle started and when in a Sothic cycle an event happened, you can now create an anchor date. To make a long story short, uh, it's more than you really want to get into in a discussion here. <laughs> Yes, no, but it's sort of the Rosetta Stone of uh, dating. Right. So this it really is. helped a lot. It is. And it's also the key issue as to why there's a high Egyptian chronology and a low Egyptian chronology. So let me put it, let me shorten the story. There was a Sothic cycle that started in the year 2773 BCE. Uh, around 
the second, third dynasty of Egypt. So you're talking a very long time, early period when they recognized this idea. And they found a date in the 18th dynasty and a date in the 12th dynasty in which it was related to a specific year in a particular king's reign. On the assumption that the Sothic cycle, that the 12th dynasty belonged to the same Sothic 1460 year cycle as the 18th dynasty, they were now able to come close to an anchor date in both dynasties and create a boundary for the second intermediate period which in Manitho's copies lasted over a thousand years, but which in reality were less than two centuries. The high chronology and the low chronology argued over which year was the particular year in that Pharaoh's reign. And the argument had to do where they thought the star Sothis was seen when it came out for the first time and they dated that Pharaoh's year. So basically you have a high chronology and a low chronology, which for the second millennium disagrees by no more than 25 to 30 years at most. And within each version of the chronology, there are gaps that have to be filled in. What I discovered is the relationship between the Genesis chronology and the high chronology. So that's where I put stuff together. And that's where we get to something very, very interesting. The patriarch Enoch. As you may know, particularly if you got into all kinds of esoteric literature in the time oh, yeah. of Jesus and later. Yep, yep. Enoch was a really important uh, iconographic figure attributed with all kinds of wisdom, genius, and everything. And there's a reason. In Genesis, in Genesis 5, we have the beginning of the Genesis chronology. And what it gives us is a list of births and deaths prior to the flood. It tells us Adam lived so many years had a son, and his total lifespan was so many years. The son lived so many years and had a son, and that's and Adam's son lived so many years. And you go down for several generations with this thing so that you have a birth year for a relative birth year for each adult and each son all the way down to the flood. Except for Enoch, there's a different formula where everyone else, for the most part, is he lived X years, had a son, and then lived the total number of years. For Enoch, it says he had a son, and at the end of 365 years, he walked with God. He doesn't actually die. He goes to heaven. And he walks and he lives 365 years. And the 365 years is a puzzling question. Biblical scholars wrestle with it because it's a solar marker, or at least sounds like a solar marker. And the Hebrews had a lunar calendar. They didn't use a solar calendar. So it might be a coincidence, but it's intriguing. So in looking at the chronology, and looking at the Genesis state, I started as experimenting. The problem is we don't have a starting date for cre uh, creation that everybody agrees upon. Christians and Jews and a lot of people have. The problem is we don't know how to connect up the Exodus to, every, to the earlier chronology because different theories give us different Exodus dates. But I went with the, uh, ex experimented with the Jewish date for, uh, for uh, creation, 3761. And when I did that, I found out that Enoch died after 365 years in the year 2774. 
The Sothic cycle began in 2773, and the previous one would have ended in 2774, the year he died. So his, di his day could be either a symbol of the end of the Sothic cycle proceeding or the start of the next Sothic cycle. And you have to remember, every day has a one-year or two-year margin of error because we're using modern calendars. The Egyptians had a calendar year that began in July. And the Hebrews had a lunar calendar, which had alternating months um, of 29 and 30 days. And so there's no easy way to cholera would say the exact year in our calendar is the exact year in the earlier calendar. Uh, so there's a one or two year margin of error. So we have now a great thesis to explore. Does Enoch whose 365-year lifespan point to the start of a Sothic cycle. If it does, that means the date of creation was not a random date picked by Jewish theory. It was a distant state from the Sothic cycle, that the key date is not the date of creation, but the date of Enoch's death. But you have to prove there's a relationship. And that's what the book does. The book then begins to look at every date in the Genesis chronology of birth and death from Adam all the way to Joseph. And it wants to, and it asks the question, what happened in the year that each person, what happened in Egypt in each year that a person was born? And what happened in Egypt in the year in which each person died. And no one has ever really done this before because no one really has an accurate chronology of Egypt because of all the problems. So what I began to do is start looking at the dates and then looking for patterns. And that was the first step is to look for patterns. And the patterns are two types, dates and relative. How long is is there between a date, two dates, and on what dates did they come? So a starting point began to show. You could see that based on patterns initially, that Genesis states fell in line with the generally accepted time frames for the different dynasties, or with at least within the sequence of Genesis dates, you can find patterns that showed parallels to plausible time periods, and you could also find durations parallel to plausible time periods, but we're still in speculation. So the next step was to go and look for precise dates, and that's what the book does. And based on the archaeological evidence in Egypt, the king lists, the Genesis chronology, the Manetho chronology, the all-important king list known as the Turin Canon of Kings, which has chronology, and the various uh, data we have from the archaeological record on chronology, I began to examine the dates and what we can determine, what we can say about the dates. And I determined that for every dynasty, from the first dynasty down to the 18th dynasty, we can establish a precise year-to-year -year date between a Genesis birth or a Genesis death and a dynastic starting date within that one-year time frame. And it all fits in precisely with standard Egyptian chronology once you align stuff uh, with the record. Yes, this is really mind-blowing, Gary. So basically, these scribes, these uh, Israelite scribes in Genesis, uh, coded these genealogies sort of as a parallel of Egyptian dynastic history. Exactly. That's basically what they did. It's incredible that they had such, they were not meticulous, but also sort of keeping it under the, the hood, if you would, under wraps. Right. <laughs> Who would figure this out? Me. <laughs> <laughs> you had to, thousands of years later, they right. knew you were coming, Gary. <laughs> but uh, more importantly, it also tells us 
that the whoever wrote these lists and whoever put this list together had ever had access to very detailed Egyptian archives. This couldn't have been done without detailed access to the Egyptian archival records in ancient times. And so we have a further really important link between the early stages of Israel and people who would have been familiar with Egyptian histories and had access to archives and stuff. And uh, so I believe that these records date from about the time of the Exodus period uh, and when the Israelites had access to deep Egyptian archives, although it is possible that Egyptians, uh, Israelites could have gone to Egypt and studied in the archives, but they must have had, they could not have done this without access to the archival records. In fact, Nitho, legendarily, we never found it, was supposed to have has allegedly claimed that in the temple at Heliopolis, uh, which was the temple, which was the most important uh, learning temple in Egypt, uh, and Joseph, the, uh, the last patriarch, was married to the daughter of the high priest of that temple. Um, there was a wall that had a tree on it, and on the tree were leaves with the name of every Egyptian king written on it. So there were Egyptian records that existed with these lists. We only found particular records. There must have certainly been many others. Uh, they, these records couldn't have been written without access to archival material, both the Egyptian king lists and the Genesis list. Yes, it's it's really fascinating. Again, it's it's mind blowing. I guess it would beg the question: Why would maybe you have to speculate? Why would at that time the Jews they were already loyal to Judea and to other gods? Why would they be interested in ancient Egyptian lore? By then, it must have been ancient to them, or they they just it still had faded, a connection. It, it, or it faded over time. It went through stages. The earliest stages, they're coming out with. Egyptian history and records. And they're saying, well, since we have, there was only one God, we must be understanding Egyptian history wrong, and they're rewriting. Then they're merging and melding with other cultures. They're becoming distant from Egyptian culture. And new levels of teachings and debates and arguments and theological splits are going on. After the temple is destroyed, uh, they're in Babylon, or a lot of their educated people are in Babylon, and they're being exposed to more of the Babylonian material, and that's coming into an editorial and redacting period of such So also. But if you'll remember in 100 and Myths, One Myths of the Bible, I take you back to a lot of the early Genesis material and show you how it was really adapted from the Egyptian myths. Um, the other thing is Israel wanted to show that its history is not odd. It's consistent with the histories of other cultures. They wanted it to be accepted as the legitimate history. So they were trying to create a history that would have uh connections to the other cultures very interesting indeed and i'm looking at your book and it says volume one egypt's dynastic periods are you working on a volume two there's going to be a volume two and a volume three volume two picks up from volume one with the mythological kings of egypt and i'm going to show that the same mythology or the mythological king lists used in Egypt that appear in Manetho and also in other Egyptian king lists, particularly the Turin Canon of Kings, is the same mythological king list used in Genesis, the period before the birth of Methuselah. 
that'll be volume two. And volume three will be the various, will be basically the chronology of creation in the Bible, how it relates to Egyptian creation myths, and how many people in the Bible are really Egyptian deities. Well, we certainly look forward to that work to add to your great canon of work itself. But I think we are coming to the end. First, uh, Vance, thanks for uh, keeping us company on this fascinating odyssey of ancient Egypt. Oh, this has been very enlightening, and um, I'm looking forward to Gary's work in the future. We all are, and I think our audience will really enjoy it. There's a lot of people in this audience who are very much into uh, very technical into Egyptian, Sumerian, oh, yeah. and so forth. Yeah, you're going to see somebody like Vanessa, her wheels turning. But uh, <laughs> um, Gary, thank you so much for returning to Aeon Byte Gnostic Radio and discussing your, your new great book, Genesis, Chronology, and Egyptian Kingless. And the subtitle, The Egyptian Origins of Genesis History. There you go. But thank you very much for making this book happen. And thank you for your time and good luck with this book and your future works. Thanks. Look forward to coming back. And there you have it. The first part of our interview with Gary Greenberg, based on his new book, Genesis Chronology and Egyptian Kingless, The Egyptian Origins of Genesis History. Are you waking up from that nightmare that is history and entering the dream that is your living myth? In our second part, we talk more about the origins of the Hebrews and the shenanigans of Akhenaten, as well as the secret behind the story of Methuselah. What about the Nephilim? Gary cracks that code, and it will make a lot of magicians and secret society members mucho unhappy. And yes, we find out who really was Moses, and what is the real deal with Noah and the Flood, and much more. As mentioned and as a bonus, I'll be including an old interview with Gary, based on his book, 101 Myths of the Bible where we get really granular on many OT events like Adam and Eve, Sodom and Gomorrah, Jacob and Esau, and more. So please become a member of Patreon at Patreon for the full dope and to keep this red pill cafeteria open. I wish I could give it all away, but I must give a pound of flesh to Maimon in the forms of bills and equipment and subscriptions. It would be nice if one or two patrons could lift this all up. But as far as I know, no rich cats listen to the show. Then again, there is a reason the Gnosticoi are with the god in the gutter, with the despised philosopher's stone buried in the mud. So please help, and I hope I have helped you against the priest and the king. We're just getting started, and Sebek still hasn't closed his maw on us. Not yet. Hello and goodbye as always. <laughs> <laughs>